I'm well. How are you today? Very well. All right. Good to see you again. Quite some time ago it was, no? Two years, I believe. Is that right? Crazy, crazy. Am I really doing this for so long now? (laughs) (laughs) Well, hey, (laughs) congratulations. I mean, moving the company from where you were two years ago to to where it is today with the team that you've put together, congratulations. That's You've made enormous progress. And the Thank tool so itself much. is absolutely phenomenal. I'm, I'm really delighted with, with what you've been able to do. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's uh, a great honor to hear it from you, really. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's easy. I'm very much looking forward uh, to our conversation now. And it's an honor to have you here as one of the experts in the demo space. And it would be amazing if you could just uh, briefly introduce yourself. Um, I mean. I could just say one sentence, uh, one or two sentences about about you uh, to to make the introduction easier. But uh, I mean, you work as the principal um, at Second Derivative, and you also had a fair share of sales and marketing experience across the board. And would love to also to to you to tell me a little bit more about your background and then how it brought you to your current role in sales, so that our listeners can also get to know you better. Well, thank you, and. Uh... <clears throat> It's a delight to join you in this call, Veronica. So history, ancient history, way back last century, I was actually trained as a chemist biochemist, and I believe I was the first person in the world to successfully freeze-dry beer, but that's another entirely different story. Yeah, it's impressive. Um, <laughs> think about it. If you're backpacking. Anyway, um, I was swindled into a sales role. I was in a series of marketing and pre-sales roles, and uh, and I spent two years in Europe, and coming back from Europe to the States, I thought I was going to be asked to, li- to uh, head up marketing. Instead, they said, uh, we'd really like you to take over the western region of the United States in sales. And I said, ha, 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 that's all very funny, but what do you really have in mind? Well, I ended up in sales, and I was, a, it was, we, was the reluctant salesperson. Uh, and I think because of that, because I had a strong technical background, it turned out that I was trusted by my customers to guide them the right ways. And what I really found was that uh, sales was not so much a thing of selling, but enabling my customers to buy. In other words, to help them through their buying processes on their schedule to meet their requirements, as opposed to trying to meet uh, quarterly deadlines. And that proved to be a very successful way to go. And I've held that... um, I've held that philosophy from basically that was about 1995 onwards. So I hope I hope that gives you a little bit of background. Very very nice to hear. Yeah, I mean that also is a perfect introduction to the topic that we're going to discuss, right? So I mean, helping the customer um, um, is really dependent on how well you understand the customer beforehand. So before the actual demo, the discovery just plays a huge role in sales, and especially during COVID. Um, uh, it's even more important than ever to 100% understand the customer's problems and really, really understand like what's on top of his mind. Um, so today we're gonna discuss the role of the discovery in the inside sales process a little bit more. And uh, since m- more and more sales um, are conducted remote, um, uh, COVID has accelerated this obviously, but this has been an ongoing trend even before COVID. Um, the discovery becomes even more important, right? Because it's also easier to set up two different calls, to set up a short call to just make sure you get the discovery right and then set up a second call to then also based on discovery, really structure the demo and make sure you help your customer solving the problem. And um, yeah, I mean, maybe the first question that I would have is in your experience in sales, how has the process leading into the product demo become even more important in these times? You know, I don't know that it's it's more important. I would say that it's both easier and harder to execute you know, proper discovery, if you will. Um, easier in that, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of this, but uh, easier in that it's, it's a delight now. You jump on a call on demo desk or Zoom or whatsoever, and you can have a conversation very, very readily. You don't have to set up a meeting. You don't have to fly or travel somewhere. Um, However, it's harder because you are unable to get some of the the first-hand visual and even tactile impressions that you have when you do an on-site visit. And a brief example of that, so so my first uh, 13 and a half years in software was spent at a company uh, that provided uh, 
chemical information software, cheminformatics, which in other words was enabling pharmaceutical uh, discovery research to do what they do. And one of the most important experiences that I had was um, visiting my customers' laboratories. So, you know, you'd meet people in a conference room, you'd have a discussion. Well, a conference room is very sterile, and you ask questions, and you get answers, and you make notes. Terrific. I, at the end of these conversations, I would say, hey, can I go see your labs? Now, scientists, chemists love to show their labs. It's, it's, it's like people who love to show their houses. And mm -hmm. so they would drag me down to the laboratory, and we'd wander around, and I would see their equipment, their desks, what they had in their bookshelves, what was in front and center on their desks, for example. Very, very interesting to see the papers, the documents, what they're working on now. Um, in laboratories, there are often glass walls between <clears throat> the lab space itself and, uh, and the office, and written on the glass would be notes, chemical structure drawings, all kinds of things. This combined experience was remarkable in terms of getting a much broader and deeper understanding of their situations. So it's easier in that you can jump on a call very, very readily. It's harder, yeah. though, to get that, that broader perspective. Does, yeah. that, does that help as a starting point? Yeah, definitely. Um, I hear what you say. So, so first thing is when you meet your customer physically rather than virtually, first you would have like more chances to, to build rapport, to actually connect with the customer and really understand the world in which he operates or she operates. Um, first thing and second thing also um, the customer would have uh, higher like more possibilities to explain also you like uh, what his context is and you would have just a, I don't know just like a better chance of connecting with him in, in many different ways so for sure this is something that you most likely have less in a virtual meeting however there are for sure as you said also some advantages right so you can set up multiple meetings it's way easier to meet anyone in the world you can over over the entire day, you can like meet a lot of different people, and um, rather than uh, in the old world, you were just able to meet one person because you had to travel there, right? So I mean, obviously there are also a lot of um, uh, benefits that come with it. Um, uh, but also like asking a bit uh, of a broader question here. So what kind of you make when leading up to a demo from your experience? The the most obvious is a dive to demo too rapidly. Um, and we should, we'll circle back on this in a little bit. Um, one way to describe this, there's been a lot of discussion um, over about the past four or five months about the word empathy. Have you, how many times have you heard the phrase, we must have empathy? Um, is that something you've heard frequently? Ah, I see she's smiling, absolutely. So is this something you've heard a lot? I think it was a recent trend, right? This started two years ago or so, and like everyone started to talk about empathy now. <laughs> right. So empathy, this is a very, very interesting thing, and it, and it relates directly to doing discovery. Empathy is all about a shared experience. Um, and an example I just did in a blog post is that, you know, you can, you can have, well, if you've never broken your leg and you meet somebody that just broke their leg, you cannot have empathy for them because you don't have a shared experience. You don't understand hmm. the pain, the shock, the fear, the worry, all the, the, the emotional elements that go into um, a serious break like that. Um, you can have sympathy, but that's very different. Um, mm -hmm. Empathy in discovery is huge. Um, most discovery conversations focus on the pain. They focus on the customer's problems that they're looking to solve, and then it's, uh, it's actually more of a qualification exercise than discovery. So the classic phrase BANT, B-A-N-T, budget, authority, mm -hmm. need, and timeline, is what far too many organizations call discovery. That's, that's qualification. That's all ruling something in or ruling something out. So if, if, <laughs> if I called... Let's say, Veronica, you called me up and you said, uh, and, I, and I had clicked the uh, CA demo button on your website, and you called me up to, to uh, quote-unquote do discovery. What often happens in the industry today is a, is a um, sales development representative or a BDR, SDR, call me up and say, so I understand you clicked on the button. Terrific. We're all excited about that. Um, are you the person that would be driving this project? And immediately my antenna go up and I say, well, well yes, I am. 
the person says, uh, do you have a budget and budget authority? Why, yes, I do, he said, as he lies gently and slightly. <laughs> um, they say, you know, do you have a defined set of needs? Well, that one I can answer honestly, yes, I do. And they say, do you have a timeline? Oh, absolutely, it's something we need right away. Well, I answered three of those questions incorrectly, basically as lies, because mm-hmm. I know that as a prospect, if I don't qualify myself in, I'm never going to see a demo. That's the customer's perspective on this. So then we move forward. Um, The essence, though, of this empathy thing is that where people are focusing on the needs and the problems, they're not getting the rest of the picture at all. So, you know, you could draw analogies with somebody going going to the hospital and saying, pre-COVID, I don't feel well, I think I've had the flu, and I've had it for a couple of weeks. Um, a, A poor doctor would say, well, just tell me about you know the pain a little bit, and, well, yep, sounds like the flu. I'm going to give you a flu med, and see you later. Let me know if anything changes. Hmm. Whereas a, a good doctor would say, well, tell me about the pain, and were you out of the country? Have you had any foods that were different or unusual? Do you have any stress in your life? Um, any changes in you know, you know motions that are going on? In other words, you need to get a much broader understanding of the customer's situation. And this, the, this big push, this phrase of empathy, is very empty unless empty empathy, unless you <laughs> unless you really actually do the rest of the exercise. So, when the biggest single mistake that uh, the people do today in discovery is not getting a much bigger picture of what's going on. They focus like a laser on the three or four elements they need to satisfy their criteria to move a lead from X to Y to Z, from marketing ready to sales ready to demo ready or whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I, um, all I could say is I encourage people to think about their own personal experiences when they have been a customer and ask themselves the question, do you feel that the vendor <clears throat> asks sufficient questions to really not only understand your needs but also a richer understanding of your situation? So does that help? Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So you're saying that um, uh, if I'm selling a software for accountants, uh, it's not necessary that I was an accountant myself in the past. Rather than that, it is necessary to put myself into the shoes of being a customer in general, like just a buyer of a software. So really under making sure that they understand what the customer's problems are. Because also what you're saying, like also the other aspect of it is you can only build empathy if you actually really understand the job of the person that you're selling to, uh, which obviously like cannot cannot be the case uh, at all times. Because um, if you, I don't know, build a huge company, for example, like build a, a, a sales team at Stripe, um, and you would sell to people implementing Stripe and integrating that into a website. There are different buyer personas. And then also, of course, you would not find salespeople who always like match the experience that the, the buyers also have themselves, right? So just for me, the question is, in order to build sufficient empathy, do I really need to understand the job of the person that I'm selling to, or is it just sufficient by asking that question? But I uh, like yeah. assume that it's ho- hopefully uh, enough to ask enough questions. And then, like the second question that I would also have: um, How can I make sure that I provide my sales reps with a structure uh, to help them actually building empathy, rather than just following a standard framework and following band in order to move to lead to the next stage? So those would be the two key questions I would have. So the I think the answers are as follows. If you have a uh, if you're selling into an industry that is deeply vertical, <clears throat> like accounting, for example, um, pre-sales people should fall into one of two categories. <clears throat> Excuse me. Either number one, they do have first-hand experience in accounting and in this type of accounting, uh, in which case they truly can have empathy. And then you still need to ask them and teach them how to ask a broader range of questions, which mm-hmm. will be part number two. Um, hmm. <clears throat> sales, t- the sales half of the house, sales representatives may not be accounting, you know, if you will, experienced, um, because they're looking at a, at a more of a business proposition pathway here. Um, for industries where it's 
difficult or impossible to have that firsthand experience, yes, then you absolutely need to equip people to ask a broader range of questions. Um, you will not necessarily be achieving empathy, but you are certainly achieving a much richer and deeper understanding of the customer's situation. And I'll give you a small example. Um, <clears throat> so culture, company culture can be huge in terms of success or failure of an implementation. So if you're looking at um, anything that's, that's enterprise where, where multiple departments might be involved, for example, ERP software, um, critical kinds of questions would be to ask things like, of your customer, to ask, um, are you, what is the corporate culture with you with respect to adoption of new technologies? Are you mm -hmm. an innovator? Are you a fast follower? Are you part of the majority? Uh, are you somebody who's a late majority, for example? Because each of those um, categories is going to have different responses to different stimuli, i.e. new software. So in a case where somebody's you know, an innovator, they're going to love you. They love, they love the new technologies. They're going to dive in. And typically speaking, they'll forgive all the mistakes with respect to uh, implementation errors and so forth. Conversely, if you're dealing with somebody who really doesn't want to change, which is what most of the majority is, and as you move to the right on that curve, um, everybody's going to find the process to be frustrating, more difficult. The errors that were forgiven by the innovators will be uh, <laughs> heightened for the people that are, are you know, slower to adopt. So even a simple question like that could have huge impact on the success or failure, not of the sale, but of the hmm. success uh, for that particular customer. Vendor. So the, getting this richer understanding of the customer's environment can be huge, much beyond the pain. Is that, how does that help answer that? So number one, I think deeply vertical markets, you do need to have understanding of that market to be able mm -hmm. to have true empathy and just to do a more successful job. But in the absence of that, learning to ask these broader sets of questions will help solve that problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I, I was a consultant before, um, uh, um, uh, a strategy consultant working for Bain. And then uh, also, also when we were consulting uh, uh, our customers, which like, is not that far from a software sell, right? Because uh, we also, rather than selling software, we would sell our services and s sell the consulting services to the customer. And uh, it was of utmost importance to really understand what is the goal of my customer? So what's the number one priority for him? And what's the number one challenge he has? And if I help him achieve that goal that he has on top of his mind with the services that I'm offering and then in the software world with the software that I want to sell to him, then he, of course, like is immediately sold. So really understanding how can I help my customer reach his goals in the best possible way um, is really the essence here. And I think it's also that what you're saying, right? And, um, and what I also would be very much interested in in that context, if you think that has changed in the recent environment with COVID-19 um, or whether that has already been the case before. And uh, also if you also see saw any other changes uh, that just came with the recent uh, uh, change in the environment. So yeah, And affects discoveries, question. of course. Absolutely. So, um... Tough question. I, I, again, I'll go back to what I said before. I, I think that uh, with COVID, many things have changed. They think they've changed more of our customers than most of us as vendors. Um, a large, large number of pre sales people have already been working from home office, for, for example, for years. Mm -hmm. um, and although now it's forced, uh, at least still in the U.S., um, <laughs> uh, for customers, it's entirely, for many customers, it's entirely new. And it's um, it's frustrating, it's worrying. They have many, many more things going on where you, if you had children, for example, um, you went off to work and you didn't worry about what went on at home for the most part during the day. Mm. But now um, the status quo is your you know, six-year-old daughter walks in while you're having a call or a conversation with somebody. Um, this is, again, this goes back to the word empathy. <laughs> This is where we need to have patience um, with the tools. We have to have patience with our customers. And actually, I'll make the comment that uh, this is a place where Demo Desk really shines uh, because it does bring all the, the, if you will, the tools and capabilities together you might want to be able to make these sessions much easier. 
COVID-19 has uh, effectively made things a lot harder. It's made things a lot easier. But for the customers themselves, I think it's made things emotionally more challenging. And that's probably the thing that's, that's most difficult right now. And that makes yeah. discovery, doing discovery, even that much more important. Mm. Yeah, no. Yeah, uh, that, that makes a lot of sense, 100%. Um, uh, I think like time, sorry. Say again. No, go ahead. No, please, I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was just going to share a very brief story. I was doing a discovery session with a woman um, about four or five years ago, and we had two calls. The first was 30 minutes, and the second was about an hour, maybe a little bit quarter, a little bit longer. And about 30 or 40 minutes into the second call, <clears throat> she says, and I have not asked her anything about this, she says, you know you've already sold me. And I said, oh, thank you for letting me know. Uh, no, I didn't, <laughs> but thank you for letting me know. And what had gone on, is that she, I had been asking questions and we've been having a conversation and doing a little bit of back and forth, but I had gained such a rich and complete picture of her environment, her needs, her team, that she was comfortable at that point to accept whatever I was going to propose as a solution. And that, to me, that is a fabulous example of when discovery goes well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think that's what everyone wants to hear, right? You have already sold right. me. <laughs> right. You've already sold me. That's the dream, I don't care huh? What you're <laughs> in a discovery, not even <laughs> even before the demo, uh, in the discovery, if the customer you, says you've already demo, sold me, that's yeah. uh, how it should be, yeah. <laughs> in the perfect world. Awesome. Um, uh, yeah, th that was amazing content and amazing insights that you shared. Um, thank you so much. Um, as you wrap up the interview because time is already is already up now and uh, I just would also like to ask you one last question uh, which is uh, what advice would you give yourself from 10 years ago knowing what you know now what advice this is a really challenging question um, number one would be to make sure to keep exercising <laughs> you mean you mean that's... physical physical exercise, physical exercise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is, um, I'll give you two pieces of advice. For, particularly for males, mm -hmm. as, as you reach mm, probably around 40 years of age or something like that, um, you believe you are invincible and immortal. <laughs> oh, wow. And you also believe that, that <laughs> your physiology, yeah, and you believe that your physiology will never change. Well, sadly, it will. So fortunately, this is, it's a, this is going to be a bit of a long story, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to finish it off. When uh, my wife and I moved to we were about, I don't know, two, two and a half kilometers uh, walking distance from the office. And uh, amazingly enough, a tram line ran right by where we were living and, and ended up within about, I don't know, 100 meters of our office. And I said, great, I'll take the tram every day. And my wife says, no, you won't. <laughs> you will walk. <laughs> And, and it was the best push that she ever did because it, it reminded me and refreshed me that the physiology problem is a serious one. More to the point, I think if I was going to give advice to my 10-year younger person, I would say be mindful to never stop learning. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you think you've reached a place where you're comfortable about your methodology, your processes, your designs, whatever you're doing, re-examine them because... Someone else will if you don't. So you always need to be innovating. You always need to never stop learning. That's I think that's actually one of the greatest things when, when building a company and having a startup is that you are forced to constantly learn because there are always new challenges that come up. So once you solve one challenge, the next one ought to... Uh, 100% the next one comes immediately afterwards. <laughs> but also when working in, in, um, as, as a consultant or as an expert in sales like you do, right? I mean, it's also for you of utmost importance to constantly learn because there are always new approaches. There are always like things you can do better. There are always customers who could do better by um, implementing an additional learning. So for you, it's also uh, especially important, right? To, uh, in your world, to constantly learn, to make sure that you always provide your clients with the best insights possible to, to make them as successful as possible. So that's, uh, that's amazing. I love that. <laughs>